Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. I'm here today with Renee Latour. This is episode 124, and she is the owner of Ticket to Freedom, which helps coaches learn to build their business while traveling. And she's also the director of operations for Dow Financial Solutions, which provides equipment, financing, and leasing solutions for small businesses. I wanted to bring Renee on because she is running two really cool businesses, and we have a lot of things in common, like uh, living in different places around the world while we travel uh, and do our business. And uh, another thing that's really interesting that I wanted to focus on uh, in this episode was uh, something that she notices with a lot of the people that she works with, which is shame and how shame can do a lot of really bad things uh, to us and to our businesses. And so uh, we're going to talk about that and see where it goes from there. So uh, Renee, why don't you tell everyone a little bit more about yourself, your two businesses and how you got to where you are right now and we'll go from there. Yeah, sure. Thanks, John. I'm excited to be here. So yeah, what well, basically my journey to where I'm at today, uh, I took the entrepreneurial plunge back in 2016. I was working a very basic nine to five kind of run of the mill type life. And I just burnt out really. I didn't know to call it that at that, that point in time, but that's what happened. I burnt out and I decided to take the entrepreneurial route. And my partner and I launched a finance company. We are loan brokers. So we basically broker loans for small businesses back in the U.S. We took that remote um, and realized we can run the business from anywhere back in 2017 and became completely location dependent in 2019. So it was around last year that I realized there was a lot of other entrepreneurs who wanted to be location independent. And that's when I started my Ticket to Freedom program. So I basically help entrepreneurs do the same thing that I've done with our finance company, um, but obviously customized to their business and making sure that they continue to serve their clients at the highest level while they're essentially removing themselves from their business and doing other things that they enjoy in life, like traveling. So I travel full time and I really enjoy it. It's an interesting lifestyle, not for everybody, um, but I am really passionate about sharing a nomadic lifestyle that I live and how traveling really does expand you as a person. And that's why I'm passionate about helping other people do the same thing. All right, great. Thank you for the intro. I'm curious, uh, where are you right now? What country are you in? Yeah, right now I'm in Lima, Peru. And that was not planned. <laughs> that's how I like to go. Uh, so I'm, this is, uh, it's December 9th when we're recording. And I decided like, I was talking with a friend of mine from Colombia and I said, I, you know, your mom's from Guatemala, right? Yeah. When are you going to Guatemala? I don't know. In January. Great. Like, let's book a ticket and go. And he's like, okay. So, so I'm, I've bu I'm booked for the middle of January to go and uh, I've done a bunch of planning, but I only bought a one way ticket. That's how I, that's how I travel. I don't know how long I'm going to be there, but I just know when I want to go. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I'm all about it. I'm all about the one way tickets, even like when I have people come meet me wherever I am, like for example, um, last year I flew my mom out to South Africa and she's like, okay, how do I book new tickets? And I said, don't worry about it, just book one way because you might want to stay here for two weeks, you might want to stay here for two months, who knows? Like be open to it. And she's a rock star, she's 72 years old and she was like, okay, heck yeah, I'll do that. Um, and so I always encourage people just look a one way, like it might be a little more expensive, maybe a couple hundred bucks, but just that flexibility to kind of just go with the flow. If you have the, the ability to do so, it's, it's really freeing. If your goal is to help entrepreneurs to become more flexible and more location independent, what's the hardest thing that you have? What's the most difficult objection you get from them, even though they come to you wanting help? the thing that's stopping them from actually getting started? The biggest thing is fear. <laughs> um, I'm sure you know all about this. A lot of times our decision-making is rooted in fear and they might not say that like, hey, I'm really scared, but what they're telling me is, you know, if I let someone in my business and they make a mistake, you know, that's gonna be really costly. I, I really can't afford to lose a client. Or, you know, if I'm traveling, you know, in a different time zone, I'm in Asia and there's like this crazy 16 hour difference. What if my client can't reach me right away? And are they going to, you know, are they going to fire me as, you know, whatever it is, maybe they're a consultant or coach or whatever. Um, so those fears keep people from 
realigning and redesigning their business to be what they want it to be and fit into the lifestyle they want. And so instead that fear dictates how they run their business and they feel like that is the only way to run your business. And I obviously make the argument that that isn't the only way to run your business and you can actually decide to not run your business in fear um, and to step through some of those things that are holding you back. So the objections are so many, like usually it comes down to risk, trust, um, again, afraid to lose clients, but it all is rooted in fear, really. Sounds like things I've heard people say um, as to why they're, they don't want to start hiring a team or they don't they they don't think they can take their business from 20, 30K to 100K a month, even though they want it. They, they just, they're afraid of X or Y or Z, which is funny because as an entrepreneur, our goal isn't to live in fear. Our goal is to live in abundance and growth and, and this, this goal of, of expansion um, so that we can help more people with the problems that they have. And yet these people seem like they're stuck at a point where they want to have a change but they're not really living and, and existing as an entrepreneur. They're kind of like a freelancer. Like I need to hold on to everything I have. So it's, it sounds like you're, you're not just helping them to run their business remote. You're also helping them to become less of a freelancer and more of like an entrepreneur. Yes. Right. And a lot of that comes from action. I'm a huge believer that to overcome these fears, to push yourself. And I'm not pushing, pushing yourself like in a ah, hustle, get it, grind it. I'm not talking in that kind of way. I'm just talking of like the realization that the fear is there. Okay. I see it. And can I embrace it and step through it? And how do you do that? By taking action. So a lot of times it, it's really small steps that get people to make bigger steps. And like in your example, okay, I know I'm at 50K a month. I know I can be at 100K a month. How do I get there? And that seems like a huge leap. And really it starts with real small steps. Um, and I think that's one of the bigger things that when you are working with someone else, that other person can help you do. Because when it's just you in a vacuum, it's really hard for you to have that, you have that big vision, you know that you're capable of it, but how, what do those small steps look like? Um, and that's where, you know, working with another person like yourself, that's where that's really valuable and uh, helpful because you have to have those small steps to push through that fear. It's only through action. So what are some small steps that are actionable? So, well, give me like a specific example, like someone's trying to do X. Company has more sales than people to serve the clients and they aren't sure what's going wrong. Okay. So the sales, you mean like they have a lot of leads coming in. They have a lot of, they're making a lot of sales, but they don't have enough people to serve their clients. Like they don't have enough um, staff basically. So they need to expand their team. Everyone has a different way to go about, you know, problem solving. For me, you definitely want to pop a hood and see what's really going on because it, even though it seems on the surface, oh, it's just a staffing problem, there might be other things going on. Um, there might be an opportunity for them to restructure what they're offering. Maybe they can increase their pricing for one without having to increase their staff. Um, they can do both. They can increase pricing while increasing staff so there's not so much of a cost for onboarding those those new people. I would go back to how they hired those amazing staff people to begin with and follow that same mold. A lot of times people try to do new things, um, like they're going different routes to recruit people. And it's like, wait a second, how did you get the first group of A, a players? How did you get all these great salespeople who are bringing in all this business? Do that same thing over and over again. Like don't, don't fix something that's not broken. So those would be like the first really simple steps that I would start with. In just this given example. The thing for them is they're providing tech services. So they're like an IT outsourcing agency. And so the way that they find their salespeople is different from the way that they find their tech people. And it's hard to find tech people for the specific languages. And so I was like, I, I ended up telling them, look, you like probably should not provide that service if it's so hard to find those people because you're you're pissing off your clients because you're making the sale but you can't perform 
and it, as a result, they're asking for their money back or it's taking too long to onboard and, and this just makes you look bad. So, you know, but then I also had said, look, your, your sales thing, sure, you should increase your price and you should probably pay your developers better to make it more likely that they're going to want to come on. And so there, there's a lot of other things uh, involved in that. For sure. Yeah, exactly. And you see that once you pop the hood. Um, okay, now okay, now I have a little more context. So it's the tech staff that's that's providing the support, and those tech staff were hard to even acquire in the first place, and that's kind of like where the bottleneck is. Interesting. Right. The salespeople were closing faster than they could hire people who hire tech people to serve the clients. So I was like, you have a great problem. You have too many sales, raise your price and maybe consider firing one of the salespeople with, even though you have that higher price, but then, you know, do you know how many calls each of these two people are taking on? Do you know who's the more efficient one of them? You know, who has the higher close rate, who has the higher, you know, oh, we don't have that information. Okay. Well, that there's your problem. You don't have any data to make decisions from. Right. You, yeah. What are you looking at to make those decisions? And then, um, of course, analyzing what's going on in the tech side. Again, I, I realize that it's probably hard to find those tech people, um, but that shouldn't just be like, oh, it's hard to find them. Don't go find them. Like if you have if you have people banging down your door for business, try to fill those seats. Like I would that would be like my number one. Like, yeah, definitely try to fill those seats instead of turning customers away. Um, I mean, you could always like there's nothing wrong with waitlisting. There's nothing wrong with getting a client on board and saying, hey, we actually don't have the capacity in the next you know three months. But if you sign on today, you pay your down payment or you pay the total amount or whatever, um, in three months, we're going to be able to serve you. And you'll be the first one because you're on this wait list. So it, that could also be a way to just give yourself a little breathing room and then all, you know evaluate the situation, figure out how you can get more tech people on board, and then also um, build demand, like have a, have a sense of scarcity. And it's not fake scarcity, it's real scarcity. And then also, um, you not have to like give people refunds. I mean, in a worst case scenario, once those three months have, uh, you know, arrived and you still haven't figured out what's going on with hiring tech people or whatever that might be, um, then at that point you could give a refund, right? Like you still have options, you still have a way out. But in those three months, if you haven't figured it out, there's probably bigger problems there. <laughs> like you said, not tracking, you know, what's going on. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff there going on. One of the other things I had said to them was you should probably think about for the long term, if there's not enough people that can have that have these skills, you should probably find a way to teach people these skills. So like, let's say you've got someone that has an adjacent skill, they can code, and they're interested in this thing. And it's a hot thing. So you find a way to create a, a course program, have your, your best people create it, and, and administer it and management and the people who do the best can get the job at the end of the day, you know, and maybe they end up paying you for the pleasure of having the, you know, going through this program. And then you, you refund them if you, if you hire them at the end. Yeah, no, that, I think that's great. I mean, it's thinking outside of the box. And I would say like, as far as going back to your original question, like what would be the first step is think about how could this be really simple? Like, how can I keep this very simple? like not complex. Don't try to copy someone else. Don't try to, you know, find it, you know, in a book, like really, how can I, how can I address this problem and find a solution in the simplest way possible? And that usually like leads people to like either think outside of the box or just like dumb it down. Like don't get too crazy or complicated or think that the problem's bigger than it is. You mentioned fear already. Are there any similarities between fear and shame? Would you say? And if so, what? Yeah, I would say definitely because a lot of the biggest fears that people have are making a mistake. Like, oh, I'm going to misstep. I'm going to make a mistake. And a lot of times that's tied to what other people will think. Um, and when there's focus on how I'll be perceived, what other people will think, there, there lies a lot of the shame and there, when you get to the core of it, that's where the shame is living. And that's where kind of the shame is breeding is I'm going to feel embarrassed or I'm going to be ashamed or, you know, what will people think or what will people say? And so I feel like they're definitely really, um, tightly close knit depending on what that specific fear is, if that makes sense. So how can you tell 
the difference between fear and shame in a client or if they have both one or the other uh, when you're doing your discovery or after you started working with them so that you can hit it and and destroy it as quickly as possible i feel like i'll give you an example because this is one that comes up a lot is perfectionism so it's it's such a big issue in the entrepreneurial space because entrepreneurs are typically high achievers are typically people who make things happen who are very independent and have a high standard for themselves and with that there's always a lot of baggage that has driven a lot of that high achievement, a lot of that, I wanna do the best, I wanna be the biggest, I want the most. It's not always healthy emotions that are driving that. And when we talk about perfectionism, that's usually what it looks like on the surface is perfectionism and what um, usually makes people very unproductive and taking too long to do something and making sure that they cross every T and dot every I before something goes out of the door, you know, and just, and, and not really being very agile, you know, in their business because they're just trying so hard to make sure that it is creme de la creme. And underneath that is shame. And underneath that is a lot of childhood traumas. And it's really a lot to be unpacked and again, I go back to, you know, when I work with my clients, I'm not going to sit there and say like, hey, this is shame and we need to really bust through this. And it's like, no, it's not, it's not really how that works. It's more of just, you know, an invitation to a client to, hey, I can call it out. Like, y this doesn't need to be perfect. Like, done is better than perfect. This just needs to go out. This needs to be done don't overthink it. You know, it's those kind of like simple things that we can coach each other on. Um, and then to get under the surface is just the opening the door and the invitation to have them do some self discovery is like, what's really going on underneath that? What's driving that, that um, perfectionism? What's driving the need to really make sure that this is perfect and without any errors. And, you know, when, when someone kind of sits with themselves and evaluates that, that's really where they're doing deep work. And that's kind of on the sidelines of what the, you know, the work that I do is like, let's get it done type work. Like we're actually doing things like we're hiring people, we're getting things out the door um, versus some of the stuff that's living on the background and why I wanted to chat about this because it's a real problem that I feel like we need to talk about as entrepreneurs. Like, oh, we're talking about, you know, the seven figures and making the money and scaling the business and hiring and, you know, all these things. Oh, network marketing. Yeah, it's great. But let's really talk about some things that are living underneath the surface that we should pay a little more attention to because the first step is acknowledgement. Like just having that awareness, like, oh, what's really going on under that perfectionism instead of just saying, ah, oh, it's perfectionism, bust through it. Like that's a temporary band-aid versus let's get to the root of it. Oh, there's some shame there. Where did that come from? Mm. Maybe it was, you know, how I interacted with my mom as a child, or maybe it was something that happened to me in the seventh grade that made me feel, you know, really crappy about myself. And it's just like those things that come out in therapy, but they come out in entrepreneurial world. They come out in business. And I feel like um, so many times we don't address it and why I really wanted to talk about this you know, today, um, because it's under there. And I think it just starts with the awareness. I've discovered that the best therapy is entrepreneurialism. <laughs> like if you want to learn about yourself, start a business. And if you want to really break through all of the bullshit in your life, start a business because if you refuse to deal with those things, your business won't succeed. And so you have no choice, but to deal with those things if you want to succeed. And oftentimes people don't realize that coaching is basically therapy without a lot of the psychological talk with all what they would say the psycho techno babble, whatever the, you know, because I, I, as you just explained, you never once in your explanation used the word fear or shame. So you have to navigate the issue without saying what the issue is directly to their face or else you'll trigger this like desire to close up so that they can avoid dealing with this thing that's very deep inside of themselves. And 
I think it's fascinating because my background's in psychology and I was a teacher for many years. And after going through multiple businesses, it's been apparent to me that I'm just cut out for being a coach, an advisor, whatever you want to call it, because of those two passions of education and psychology, where you wouldn't normally think that until you experience it and you go, oh, actually, like teaching plus psychology equals helping people to become better with real science behind it to make sure that they actually make those changes and improvements as long as they're willing to do the hard work. And I don't know, I just, I, a little rant, but I, I think it's really interesting. No, 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 not ranty at all. I, yeah, I totally agree. Amen to that. Like entrepreneurship is the quickest, maybe not quickest. It's, <laughs> it's a long, you know, a long, uh, uh, marathon, but it is, it is a, a great way to learn about yourself and really face those, those, um, thresholds of growth because to expand, like you were mentioning earlier, I really feel like to expand, you do have to shed old layers of yourself and you have to let some of the old habits, the old mode of operation, you have to let a lot of that stuff die. And it's difficult. It is a death and birthing process that you go through internally when you are birthing businesses. And I, I truly believe this. this is why I'm, I'm so passionate about it. And I feel like what you're saying as far as like when you're talking to a client, whether you're coaching, consulting, whatever, you're not going to say it right out like, hey, you have shame. Like you, you have some emotional intelligence to not, you know, come across like that. But I think a lot of development can happen in the space, whether it's with your clients or even something like this. Someone's listening to this podcast by just us sharing our stories and us sharing like, hey, I feel shame. You know, I, I have this shame that's underneath, you know, this perfectionism that shows up in these ways. And I feel like sharing that helps other people realize that they're not alone, realize that they can get comfortable with it, um, realize that they can have the acknowledgement to embrace it. Like I said, that way they can move past it. That way they can step through those fears. So I, I'm going to share the last time I felt shame. And then I'm going to ask you to share yours. So get ready. And this, this happens sometimes to me. It, it, it's it's an, a reoccurring thing that happened a few months ago in the last iteration. Uh, so I was part of, or I am part of a Discord server that's about entrepreneurship. There's about 12,000 people in it for you to join. One of the best servers I've ever, or one of the best communities I've seen online. And so... I joined it with the hope of finding clients, really. There's a lot of uh, voice channels on there, and every day there's you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 people on the voice channel just chatting, sharing their ideas, their struggles with their business, people giving each other advice and all that. And I thought it would be a good way for me to be able to um, add value and, and show what I could do without being salesy and um, actually got a number of people reaching out to me uh, privately to see about my services based on, you know, advice I was giving in the voice channels. And I thought I was doing a pretty good job with it, but apparently I was coming across as arrogant because I get really passionate when people talk about their business and my own businesses and all that. But the way that I was telling them that their idea wasn't right or whatever was kind of in your face a little bit and so I was kind of putting some people off but I wasn't aware of it so I ended up getting kicked out of the server because multiple people ended up complaining about how I was handling this situation but I wasn't told why I was just banned luckily I know the founder so I was able to send him a, a message and I was like hey man like what's going on you know oh multiple people were complaining about you and the way you communicate with them what are you talking about? And so we ended up having a chat and he explained and I was like, look, you know, I would love the opportunity to be able to talk to some of the people in the server and, and just kind of see what it was that I was doing because I'm, I wasn't aware that, you know, like, I don't think I'm a bad person. My goal isn't to, you know, come on and tell people that they're idiots. And like, obviously I wasn't saying they're idiots to their face. Like, obviously there's a disconnect because I'm not a bad person, right? I'm not, like, my goal isn't to hurt other people. My goal is to help. And if I 
if I wasn't being helpful or if the way I was saying things was not being helpful, then I need to know about that because that's not who I am. Right. So he gave me another chance. I got, I got to be able to speak to some of those people and I was able to learn from that experience. And I felt really ashamed for like a week or two. I was really like, like, uh, talking down to myself that that's not really healthy either, but I was just like realizing I need to be more humble because I, I came into the server with a lot of knowledge and experience that a lot of other people there don't have yet. I'm one of the oldest people in the server, and and that's one of the reasons why. I've just had more years on my belt. And I guess the way I was talking to these people wasn't becoming of an advisor or or a consultant. And so when I was able to get that opportunity to go back in, I started explaining to people, look, you know, I I was just going through a rough time, and uh, I don't know how that happened. It's not who I am. And, And some of the people said it was as simple as just asking questions instead of telling Right. So, so instead of saying something like, oh, you shouldn't be doing it like this, you should be doing it like this, just ask, be like, well, have you considered doing it like this? Right. Something so simple as just showing uh, inquisitiveness and curiosity is, is enough to uh, kind of get rid of that tension and make them feel like you're not looking down on them or talking to them, which again, I, from the start, my goal wasn't to do any of that, but, but I was quite ashamed of it because that's not who I am. Um, and sometimes we say and do things without realizing it. And that was a a huge lesson for me. And, and ever since then, I've, I've been a lot happier thinking about like the way I communicate with other people. Um, so what's, what's the last time you felt shame? That's a great story and a great example. And I love how you shared how you used it as a learning experience. And I think, again, it goes back to having the openness and the awareness of, okay, I feel shameful, but I'm not going to let shame run my life and just run from it. I'm going to ask, like, like you said, thankfully you knew the founder, you could ask him personally, like, Hey, what's going on? Why was I kicked out? Instead of just like blaming, right? Like, ah, oh, they're a bunch of losers. I don't know what they're doing. That's why, you know, I, I'm too good for them, you know, whatever. Um, and then, like you said, asking like, Hey, how could I have helped you better? Oh, just a small tweak to how I was phrasing how I'm helping, you know, instead of telling you this is how you should do it, asking as a question. Um, I think that's really beautiful that you had that whole, I mean, this is a simple example, right? But this is something that like you used as a learning opportunity and now you're back in the group and you're a better person because of it. You're a better communicator because of it. What was your last feeling of shame? Let me be clear. Um, It's an maybe not daily. It's like a weekly battle. Um, I could talk about travel. I could talk about uh, the one that that's coming to my mind. I could share multiple. Let's see how much time we have. Um, one that's coming to my mind that was interesting was LinkedIn. So I use LinkedIn just to post, just to, um, have community with people get obviously get new leads by, you know, um, having like a conversation with people, very humanistic. It's not like I go on there and I'm just like, Hey, you know, hitting the pavement and trying to get people into my program. Um, I really go on there because I want to connect with coaches. I want to build relationships, see what they're struggling with, see if I can help. Um, so I'm posting content and doing all of these things. Well, of course I'm connected to people that I previously worked with. Um, in my old nine to five job, I'm connected with people that I work with in my finance company, because as you, as you, uh, explained when we, you first introduced me, we have a finance company and that f- company didn't go anywhere. That company basically runs itself. Um, so I'm doing this in addition to, you know, the finance company and I'm on LinkedIn and I'm still connected to all of these other prior connections. And if I feel like this level of, um, self-doubt or even perfectionism of thinking, oh, what will people think? Because I'm posting about, you know, how to automate in your business, how to delegate, what it means to be a leader. You know, I'm, I'm posting a lot of information about my consulting services. I'm not, um, you know, obviously, and they don't know, they're kind of keeping up with what I'm doing in business and what I'm doing in life. And I got a message, like, so I'm, I'm doing this, I'm posting whatever. I got a message from a previous boss that I had, goodness, this is like eight years ago, nine years ago, like a long time ago, you know? And so she messages me and she's like, oh my God, you have a consulting business now? Like question mark, question mark, exclamation point, you know? And then like when I saw that message, I got this total like 
oh my God, like this, it kind of like freaked, freaked out. Like, oh, this is really uncomfortable. Like I have this level of um, kind of a shame or like, oh my God, now, you know, everyone's looking at me and my, and my LinkedIn and judging me or, or trying to figure out what I'm doing. And like, I had this, these really weird, icky feelings all about, you know, how other people are going to perceive me and having shame around that. So I sat with it for a little bit and I was thinking, okay, what's the best way to go about this? Like, and I talked to somebody about it, like one of my colleagues, and I was like, yeah, I'm kind of feeling kind of weird because, you know, I'm posting to link it, LinkedIn and other people, you know, from my past are seeing my, you know, my content and they're curious about what I'm doing and all this and that. And so he said, well, just delete them, just delete all those people. Like, you know, do, why are you connected with them anyways? Like, they're, you know, you can't help them. Da, da, da. And I, and I said, no, that's not the answer. Like, I didn't even think about it for a split second about deleting them or anything. I said, no, that's not the answer. The answer is to embrace it. Like the answer is like, I just have to sit with these icky feelings and figure out, you know, what's going on there and how I can continue forward. Um, and so I wrote her back and I said, oh yeah, I started this consulting business. It's really fun. Like I'm helping these coaches, their businesses, da, da, da. And so um, I wrote back with her. We had like a really nice exchange. I told her how much I really loved her as a mentor, like when I was working with her and stuff. And she was like, ah, I wish you would come, you know, work with me. And, da, da, da. and so it was really a lovely exchange. But um, I had to step through that shame, like a feeling some kind of weird way because people from my past. And the funny thing about that is, first of all, nobody really cares people are always just focused on themselves. Like we always think people are thinking about us and they're not like, <laughs> so it's just like this constant reminding, like nobody cares, nobody cares about you. Like they are just caring about themselves. Um, secondly, the answer is not to run or to hide or, you know, oh, I'm not gonna connect myself with these people anymore. Um, because first of all, a lot of those people might need your help, you know, and a lot of those people you have relationships with and it's such a small world um, that there is always a way that you can connect with people. And so why would you, you know, just remove people from your life or from your ecosystem? Um, so to me, that, that that's just one that's really coming to my, to, to my mind in business. And, and actually even still, like, it's still kind of something like, when somebody from my past kind of messages me and they're curious about what I'm doing, it kind of comes up and then I get to step through it like every time. Um, so that's kind of one of my examples that I wanted to share. So a pretty good example as well of how you learned something from that and didn't run away from it. I'm curious though, is there some experience you've had with a client or another person where they couldn't get through the shame? The example that's coming to my mind is um, I've worked with a client who had a lot of a lot of traumas around victimhood and falling into that victim role and always wanting to be in that role of the victim instead of the creator. And I know that there's a lot of shame around that. I know that that's kind of a form of not facing you know, um, ownership or taking leadership in your business. Um, and it's a lot of times easier to blame, to say, oh, it was because that person I hired or, oh, that client, you know, didn't respect me. And it's always, you know, pointing the finger outward. And instead of, you know, taking ownership and saying like, hey, I'm actually in control, there might be some things going on underneath and not wanting to address that. Um, it's really difficult to unpack. And again, there's only so much we can do, right? Like people really do need to seek, you know, life coaching or therapy or whatever it might be. Um, when I'm helping people in business, these things come up and I try to, again, push through that with action. And I'll give you an example, like this particular client always being in that victim role, always being in that, I, you know, comes that, that whole victim thing of these people are out to get me. Of course, that attracts that it, it attracts a lot of that energy and then puts out a lot of that energy. So, you know, she was very risk adverse. So one thing that I helped with was hiring someone, of course, um, because the goal was removing her from the business and starting off small, like starting off with a really small project. Like I, I'm pro uh, freelancers, by the way, like I'm all about like gig economy. And for most roles, you don't need a, a full-time employee. And so this, this was one of those cases where it was a freelancer 
and to kind of start stepping out of that victim mentality um, was to just take those small steps like okay this with this particular freelancer we're only giving her access to this small area of your business and we're going to do a small test project to get started and see how that goes and um you know you can't win everybody <laughs> you know it's like again everyone's kind of in their own journey and i feel like there's still just the struggle that she has with being in that victim role and sometimes i mean i'm okay with saying hey i've done everything that i can do to try to get your business moving into a certain way but again like we we're talking about there's a lot of work there that needs to be done interpersonally you know taking the time to sit and say what's going on here like why am i always pointing outward and not taking the leadership role and really owning you know what i'm creating in my life and what i'm attracting and i could do everything that i could do on my end but there was it was just too thick that um protection and wanting to, you know, always have someone to blame and always play the victim. And underneath that, undoubtedly was shame for sure. One thing that a lot of people don't realize when they're running a business is if anything goes wrong, it's always your fault. Even if someone else made a mistake, it's your fault because you didn't give them the support they needed or you didn't give them the training or you didn't hire the right person or you didn't have enough documentation or whatever, it's always your fault. And if you can't take responsibility for that, then you shouldn't be running a business. Yeah, and you bring up a good point because I think what happens a lot of times is like you're taking responsibility, you have that self-responsibility, and there is a line that you don't need to cross to like berate yourself or like beat yourself up over it. Like, you know, you wanna learn from mistakes that you make. Um, and continue to move forward. But I think that there is, there is a, you know, the other side of that. And there is a pitfall that people can fall into where they, they are almost like too responsible and like almost too accountable where they're now trying to control the situation. And then now when something doesn't go as planned, it's their fault and they feel really nasty about it and they can't get over it and they can't move forward. So I totally agree with you, but then I just wanted to mention that there is kind of like a flip side to that where if it's in excess, <laughs> it's really harmful and it's not helpful at all. So I feel like there's, yeah, I feel like there's a spectrum to everything and you know, it, you, there could be like almost too much self-responsibility, almost too much of feeling like you're in control when people are going to do crappy things. Like people are going to come in and, you know, affect you in some way and life is happening. And, you know, it's bigger than just your, your little, you know, vacuum, your little world and things are happening. And it's all about how you're going to respond to that. So you do have to be okay. It's not about blaming, but it's like, yeah, that person was kind of shitty and there's not a whole lot I could have done about it, you know, could have done about it. And then you move on. So it's, it's not, all black and white is just what I want to throw in there. <laughs> I guess the, the learning lesson for me is every time a mistake is made, it's a way to improve the business, right? So if you find that that person was shitty, chances are you messed up your hiring process. You hired the wrong person. How can you make your hiring process better? What rule do you have to put in place? What process do you have to fix? Et cetera, et cetera. And this is something I learned from my, my partner, Mark, uh, who was a COO for my uh, last company, because he would always go, yeah, we made a mistake. All right, well, let's, let's fix it, right? So what, another shameful experience, uh, sorry, sorry, another shameful experience for me was I would come to, to a problem sometimes with anger, right? If, if I saw that someone on the team did something that I thought wasn't right, I would get angry and I would show that anger to them not a good way of running your business. I learned from that to come with curiosity instead and, and information, right? So uh, so what my, my partner would point out was, you think there was a problem, but you don't have enough information to make that determination because you're not involved in everything. So let's find out what happened, let's find out why it happened, and let's come up with a solution with that person so that it won't happen again. Therefore, any mistake that happens is, a, an, is an opportunity to fix the business and make it better. I think just first going back to 
what you were saying with identifying what role you played. I, I agree completely. So even if the person was awful, you know, you did play a role in that. What was that? You know, you don't have to own the whole 100% of the situation. You know, there was another person involved, but what what role did um, did I play? And then also just really being mindful because it, it gets tricky. Again, it's, I see uh, some clients who, they want to have rules and they want to set up a system based on a bad apple on, again, I'm just going to keep saying a shitty person. So this can come to not only hires, but also clients like, oh, this person, I was going to use a silly example. Oh, this person, you know, didn't show up for a call because of this reason. So now I'm going to add another question on my call booking page that says, Hey, if no, do, do not set up your systems for the shitty people. Like, don't do that. So like, it's like a balance of the two, like knowing how to structure it in a way so you can avoid those problems, but also not setting up your systems so that you're avoiding all of these bad apples that are really not, you know, those, those are more far and few in between. Um, I really do feel like 99.9% of people like are, are cool and they're fine. Um, so don't set up your systems for those bad apples. So that's one thing I just wanted to mention with that. And then going into your second piece about like it, how you interact with your team. It's funny that you bring that up because I was just talking about that today. Um, I, someone on my team made a mistake. And again, like you said, you can go at it with kind of like anger, like we need to make sure this never happens again. Like this was a very costly mistake. Um, and so instead I took a step back. It's always like my answer to almost everything is just give yourself some space. Like just give yourself a little space, like close your laptop put down the phone, like do it, go on a walk, like give yourself a little space so that you can let that emotion kind of subside a little bit. And you don't have that in the driver's seat that the emotion can be passenger in the back seat, but not the driver. And so instead like go to it with curiosity. Like, it's so funny. I, I was just having this conversation and say, Hey, I just want to know, like, this is exactly what I did. Like, I just want to know what your thinking was behind what happened. Like the conversation, like, tell me what, what, where you were, what you were thinking what your train of thought was because like you said I did not have that information like so I could just be like oh my god we cannot let this happen again like you know and be really frantic about it instead of just like let me get the information and then I saw like ah it was because he thought he he had this information like part of our standard operating procedures like part of this SOP wasn't clear like it just wasn't clear and so he told me like oh because of this piece of the SOP this is why I thought da, 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 da. and I'm like ah so now I know what the problem was, I know where he was coming from, you know, all of those emotions have completely um, dissipated because he had an explanation, like this is exactly why he did it. We could change the SOP, we could fix the problem and move forward, it's not gonna happen again, instead of being a hot mess and having this like really terrible interaction with, you know, a team member. That happened enough times for me that I had to learn from that finally because I couldn't keep letting it happen. Um, similar to the whole thing with the, this community, but different where I wasn't, I wasn't coming to something with anger because it, yeah, it was just a different situation, but, but the solution in both situations was just be more curious. Yeah. I think that's a great solution. And then I think also, again, it's not so fun or pretty, but digging a little bit deeper, like where is this anger coming from? You know, where is this, it looks like arrogance, but maybe it's actually just excitement or or knowing that I have the answer or what some refer to as like toxic positivity like where is that coming from what's underneath that it could be shame it could be something else you know I I think just a little bit of digging um, to really kind of see what's at the root I feel like helps also build the awareness when we are faced with these kind of situations how can people follow up with you yeah you can find me I'm on Instagram and LinkedIn mostly so LinkedIn you can find me Renee Latour I'm sure we'll have links and stuff. And then Instagram, fancy underscore nomad. Um, and you can see, obviously, Instagram is much more personal. I share like my travel stuff and all kinds of tips and things like that. And feel free to shoot me a DM. I'm happy to help you if you are in the space of wanting to hire, wanting to grow your business and need some help along the way. I'm happy to help out. Thank you for that, Renee. I appreciate your time and your energy. Don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. And it's okay to feel things, but it's not okay when those things get in the way of doing what you need to do, which is serve your clients and take care of your team. So don't forget also to take a step back and think about why you do what you do and why you feel what you feel. 
so that you can unlock the secrets of satisfaction and contentment in your life so that you can have the best life and the best business and the best team that you possibly can. Thank you, Renee.